Well, hello everyone. Happy Thanksgiving to you all, and good afternoon. I'm actually in the Eastern time today, so I can say good afternoon. Um, before I get started too much further, can those of you who are watching confirm that you, you can hear me? Uh, just type in the chat if you don't mind. Just to confirm that the sound is good. Um, so just let me know when you when you do get that. Okay, so a couple announcements today. I emailed you all. Awesome, thank you. Okay, um, a, a couple things here. Um, first, I'm going to delete this person. Okay, so a couple things here. I sent an email. Uh, with a reminder of um, when our final exam will be. That's next Wednesday at 10 to noon. I'll give more details about that at the end of the week. Um, essentially, it'll be take-home test. You'll have two hours with a little bit of buffer room to, um, to allow for you to print it if you need to, scan whatever work you do, and make sure that your systems are all working properly. So that's my expectation for the exam, kind of in a nutshell. I posted three additional um, quiz participation activities for this week. It was um, something that I, I've been meaning to do, post a couple of those I didn't get to before Thanksgiving, and I wanted you all to have that opportunity for additional quiz grades um, for your overall grade. Okay, and with that, I'm going to get into our topic today, which is nutrient removal. Um, well, really nutrient removal and biosolids processing. Um, both topics really involve um, or are interested in how what we're doing with the, the other nutrients in wastewater. Can we recycle some of the um, <clears throat> some of the waste that was the waste nutrients that otherwise could pollute our waterways. So here's a good picture um, we see on screen here, this vibrant neon green algae. Uh, this is essential eutrophication in action. Eutrophication is the word uh, we use when, we, when we're talking about how bacteria, algae, and other microorganisms grow to an extreme degree given the right resources and ultimately they're going to um, way overproduce. Given that this is a green algae, the surface probably has lots of oxygen, but at nighttime or when they die below them, that's gonna be oxygen depleted, and then you can get bad fish kills that way. Okay, so nutrients, we've talked about this, we've mentioned it a little bit. Um, in our wastewater treatment, one of the primary goals was to remove carbon. Um, we also removed some nitrogen and phosphorus in the process. Um, we talked about the CNP ratio, how much carbon versus nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, so today we're going to talk about a few strategies that we can use for uh, removal of nitrogen and phosphorus, and then um, talk about uh, one way we can reuse the sludge we form and the nitrogen and phosphorus that's captured in that sludge um, during our processing. Okay, so nitrogen transformation is one of the first things that we want to pay attention to. Uh, from thinking back on our BOD lectures, we, we know that we could model how oxygen, you know, if we had oxygen here on this scale, we could say, well, when we discharge waste and then we're looking at the time or the distance downstream, we know our oxygen ends up sagging and then eventually coming back. So we can kind of do the same thing with nitrogen species to understand what happens when we discharge uh, organic nitrogen. So at first we would have um, lots of organic nitrogen, whether that's urea or other maybe DNA molecules have lots of nitrogen compounds. Whatever it is that we're discharging in the organic nitrogen form will eventually be uh, degrading. So if we start with organic nitrogen, we we may expect it to do something like that. So we'll call that one 
organic N. So in addition to that, we could have, um, when that's uh, broken down, that becomes ammonia and ammonium. So NH3 and NH4 plus. <clears throat> so um, a total, total nitrogen, you know, if we're talking about how much nitrogen we have here, we could imagine our total somewhere up here. At any given point, all of these nitrogen species will add up to this amount unless we're exporting some as nitrogen gas. So this would be the total, um, we could call it bioavailable. And I think there's a, another term for it, total Kjeldahl nitrogen. So this is going to include um, organic nitrogen, the ammonia species, NH4 plus or NH3, it's going to include nitrates and nitrites. So that's nitrite there, nitrate. And it's going to include, um, yeah, so that actually that's that should be about it. So in terms of all of those, we can track how many of those or which ones of those are present at, at which times. So thinking about ammonia next, as, as we'll see from our nitrogen cycle we've mentioned before, these nitrogen species, when we discharge the organic nitrogen, the first thing that comes out, uh, it becomes ammonia, essentially. So we probably start with a low amount in the system. Let's imagine this as a river. And so as this organic nitrogen is being broken down, we start having formation of ammonia um, and ammonium. And eventually that's transformed back into, um, or forward into nitrate and nitrite. <clears throat> so that would be our ammonia there. Let's label that. Okay. Now this, this process that we're going through right now is actually uh, very important for aquariums. So if you ever keep an aquarium, I'll talk about this in a moment, uh, but this is exactly what you need to watch out for in terms of starting off your aquarium and avoiding uh, any sort of fish kills. Okay, so that's ammonia. Ammonia is toxic. Uh, so that's one of the primary concerns is this ammonia curve right here. Well, ammonia is also transformed into um, nitrite. So we, we have um, so this organic nitrogen goes to the ammonia form, that one goes to nitrite, um, NO2 minus, which then goes to NO3 minus, nitrate. That's the general um, way of things go, organic to, nit to ammonia, to nitrite, to nitrate. Okay, so the next curve then um, that we have form is the nitrite. So we imagine, again, we probably don't have a lot in the system. Maybe there's some just naturally in the river. Um, but as soon as we start producing more ammonia, this starts increasing. And then as we've produced, taken most of that um, ammonia and transformed it, we get more and more of this nitrite until that is transformed into, into nitrate. So we have that one there. And then finally, same thing's happening. It's a little more common to have nitrate sitting around since it's this endpoint to these um, nitrogen processes anyway. So typically streams and rivers are gonna have some, um, some amount of nitrate in them. And as this is being transformed, I should probably draw that a little better. As nitrate is being formed, excuse me, nitrite is being formed, then, we're, then we'll start forming nitrate. So um, probably look something like this, where again, we have the peak start happening a little bit later. And then by the end of this, again, assuming I drew this to scale, then all of these should add up to the total. Um, if we were to add all those components together and if everything was drawn to scale nicely. Um, and that's also assuming we never took any of this 
nitrate and turned it into nitrogen gas. So the ultimate endpoint is N2 gas. Um, but in terms of the bioavailable stuff, uh, most organisms cannot use N2, and it's hard to convert nitrate into N2. So we don't normally deal with it. Okay, so that's kind of the picture I wanted to show you here as a function of distance or time since we discharged some wastewater, we can see what's happening to these nitrogen species. Now, I mentioned the aquarium situation. Well, this uh, green, green line here, that's the, the most likely component that would kill your fish. If you start a new aquarium, it's kind of like you start off your, um, and you put a fish in it or some organism, it's and you start feeding it, you're introducing nitrogen. Um, it's going to excrete waste. That waste is going to be in the water. And the important thing about a new aquarium is it doesn't have bacteria. Oh, thank you. Uh, this purple line is nitrate, NO3. So the important thing about a new aquarium is we don't have the bacteria that are converting from the organic. Um, well, the organic converts pretty readily. and the biological process inside the organism itself is going to do that, the fish or the whatever you have. So you're going to be forming this first one, but if you don't have bacteria converting it to the next one and to the next one, then you end up accumulating toxic amounts of ammonia and nitrite. So ammonia is the most toxic than nitrite. Nitrate is not very toxic. Can be a problem for infants if there's a lot of nitrate in the water but that's several milligrams per liter, um, and it's not usually a big risk. Even though we have some nitrate in the water, uh, groundwaters in particular, it, it's really not a, a big risk factor compared to something like ammonia. So if you don't have the bacteria established yet that do this conversion, then you're just gonna accumulate more and more ammonia and your fish will die. And you have a sad day. So what you wanna do if you're starting a new aquarium is get a very, very small fish, don't feed it much, and let the aquarium, um, let the bacteria populate the aquarium, start coating the rocks and the, um, all the surfaces in the aquarium, and then they're processing this timely enough so that you can have more fish safely. Once all the bacteria are there doing this, um, and assuming you're managing the other aspects, it, it becomes kind of a, an okay situation. In terms of wastewater, we, we don't want to let this ammonia spike happen um, and get too large in a body of water because then we're killing the fish, right? So that's um, kind of why we're interested there. Okay, so all sorts of different processes here are affecting nitrogen. We took a glance at this before. Uh, we can go in depth on each of the different components. Like I said, nitrogen gas is kind of the the largest um, source or the uh, the main form that nitrogen is in in our environment um, we could look you know closely at each one of those different processes that transform one way or the other maybe a simpler way uh, to look at it is this diagram we have looked at before we have our plant and animal life adding nitrogen in terms of decaying matter, waste, um, waste products, the stuff like that. Those decompose. We have lots of decomposers responsible for that. And ultimately you get that ammonium and ammonia. From there, we have different bacteria that are responsible for producing, transforming um, to nitrate, nitrite, and all of these things. Uh, some bacteria can denitrify, turn it into, turn nitrate into nitrogen gas. Um, we don't have a huge amount of that, but some of our wastewater processes target that. And we have nitrogen fixation that can happen going the other way. In terms of a wastewater treatment design, uh, what we want to do is consider how to optimize this process that takes the nitrogen and ultimately converts it to N2 gas. So specifically this denitrification is gonna be pretty important. 
Um, we're just going to take a, a brief look at how, you know, what kind of processes can do that for us. So here we have a schematic, um, and instead of our typical primary sedimentation, then a activated sludge aeration basin, and then another sedimentation basin, um, here we're adding in uh, an additional step. So in this case, we have the carbon oxidation, so that's our typical aerated basin, um, but combining it with nitrification. So we're combining it with a step that is turning ammonia into nitrite, or nit yeah, nitrites, and then turning nitrites into nitrates. So combining our typical waste activated sludge with these two components. <clears throat> and to be honest, a typical waste activated sludge system can will can and will do both. Um, okay, so we have that. That's kind of what we normally have. But in addition, we add this anoxic denitrification. So taking one, one more look here, during nitrification, we're adding oxygen. So we have this ammonia molecule, and we want it to transform into something with NO2 or NO3. So where you need oxygen, and the bacteria need oxygen in the form of O2, in order to add it to that molecule and create the NO3. So that's, that's why we have the oxygen component. Next, we have denitrification. That was the next, that anoxic denitrification. So anoxic meaning we starve it of oxygen. So no dissolved oxygen. We let all the biology just take all the oxygen away. And then that allows organisms to start using nitrate as an oxygen source. So when bacteria want to use oxygen to do their, um, their metabolism, to eat food and to gain energy from it, they need an oxygen source. So then they have some organic stuff and they add, instead of oxygen, they're gonna add nitrate and they're gonna take these oxygens and they're ultimately going to form N2 and CO2. Because again, they're oxidizing some sort of carbon stuff, some organic carbon, they're changing it into CO2 or something like that. And they end up releasing this N2 because they've, they've consumed the, um, the oxygens from that nitrate. This is not balanced, obviously, and there's, there's more complexity to it, but that's, that's the process. And that's why changing the oxygen conditions here allows for that to happen. So then we have NO3 ultimately going to N2. And again, this N2 is um, really uh, not a big impact on, on pretty much anything. It's very inert. We use it in laboratories to study what happens when you have a gas that doesn't do anything. And it's, uh, it's really, um, it's safe, right? Our, the air we're breathing right now is about 70% N2 gas. So that's a good endpoint. If we are able to release that, then we have um, an effective process where we're taking this nutrient that we don't want in solution, we don't want to discharge it downstream, and just ejecting it into the atmosphere um, in a completely uh, wholesome manner, we'll say. Okay, so there's another way. Um, really, there's several ways, but here's a, another example. Um, and this one cycles it a few times here. We have our raw wastewater probably have, um, you know, the sedimentation basin, and then coming into here. Then we have this anoxic denitrification. So we go ahead and start the process in the first place with that denitrification. Then you give it oxygen again and convert more. So this, this one converts NO3 to N2, um, but we still have lots of NH3. And so this one's going to convert the NH3 type things to, excuse me, NH3 to NO3. And then we're gonna do it again. So then we're gonna take the extra NO3 that we have now, convert that to N2. And finally, a last aerobic uh, tank. 
and we have a couple of sludge return lines here um, just simply for the, the bacteria. Um, in some cases it's it's good to um, control where you're taking them from um, in the middle of it. So you don't need to know a lot about this. I'm just showing another example. Um, other innovations that have been made to ultimately remove as much nitrogen as we can before discharging. Okay, so that leaves us um, a couple of options for nitrogen, a couple of examples of why, why that's important. Um, the next would be the phosphate cycle. So this would be um, phosphorus cycle here. So here we have um, the phosphate cycle is much different than the nitrogen cycle or the carbon cycle uh, because really there's no atmospheric component. Um, we have phosphorus or phosphate in minerals, so in rocks, and in organisms, so um, well also in, in water, right? So we have rocks, that can be a source of phosphate for natural waters, um, that can be exported, and it says here very slow to groundwater, to rivers, to um, lakes, all of that. Plant life, animal life, pretty much all has some phosphorus in it. So these are going to be cycling back and forth with the decomposition and um, extraction. Uh, it turns out that birds and bats excrete a lot of phosphorus in their excrement based on their diets and how they, how they function. So some of the, the best phosphorus mines that we've used, um, including some for uh, mining the components for explosives, have come from bat or bird nesting areas where there's lots and lots of um, bat guano or bird excrement. Uh, so it kind of goes to show how you nature can concentrate certain, uh, certain things like that. It's quite interesting. In terms of removing it, from our, our systems, really what we want to do in this case is consolidate the phosphorus into the bacterial mass like we did with the carbon uh, in order to remove it that way since we don't have the atmosphere to eject um, phosphorus into it since that's not an option. So there are a few other um, arrangements and again we could potentially include these in the secondary treatment or call it a tertiary treatment step. Um, and again, it's going to make use of different um, bacterial processes. Uh, we don't need to get into the, the nitty gritty here, but maybe we have some unaerated or some strictly um, anaerobic, combining those with aerobic, meaning we're adding oxygen. So we've got a legend here. Um, sometimes we would say strictly no oxygen and then um, anoxic meaning there might be some but we're not adding it um, and then we have we're adding oxygen for example so different ways to combine those different technologies um, and then there, again there's plenty of biochemical reasons why those all work okay so moving from there I want to tell you about so that that kind of um, you know, there, there's a lot to those. Again, I'm not going in, in depth here, uh, but that's extracting the, the nutrients from the water itself and from the, the junk that's in the water. Uh, moving on from there, what I wanna say is once we form the solids, once we have the bacterial um, sludge and the, the sludge that comes out of our waste systems, what can we do with that to harvest the nutrients there? Well, um, it may remind you you know, thinking about all that waste material may remind you of composting. So we can actually do some advanced type of composting for our municipal um, wastewater sludge and then relatively safely apply that to, um, to land as a fertilizer or uh, for some other uh, purposes. When we consider that, there's a few obvious concerns. Uh, first would be pathogen reduction. We don't want to be um, growing all of these bacteria and having so many bacteria in our system and then directly go and 
put that on planted crops that we're going to eat, right? That's a, a very bad idea. So we want to make sure that we're reducing them, controlling them, and controlling what types of crops we can put these on. So typically, biosolids are not used for anything directly human related. Um, it would be more, it, it would be something that's um, more processed or something like um, growing as uh, maybe as animal feed or something that's not as um, not as direct for human consumption. Uh, there's another concern for contaminant containment. Uh, we have all of the sludge, it's very contaminated, there's probably heavy metals, and so uh, we want to con be concerned about what we're doing to make sure that our, as we're composting it, we're not exporting contaminants, maybe bugs getting into it, maybe uh, liquid leaching out of it, any of that. Okay, so then there's finally the last safety concern is kind of obvious concerns if we are inadequately treating or handling it. Uh, you know, people getting sick from uh, exposure to the biosolids themselves, <coughs> or you know, if the biosolids aren't treated properly, uh, then then what happens? Okay, I mentioned this, but the utility really lies in uh, the fact that we can make use of so many uh, high quality nutrient sources that we were that were otherwise a problem. Right, at first we had this problem of we don't want to put this waste into the water or to have it escape downstream because things will grow and cause problems for that receiving water. Well, on the flip side of that, it's actually a very good um, material. It's a very valuable material in terms of using it for what we would normally pay quite a bit um, to obtain was this fertilizer with nitrogen, phosphorus, um, potassium, other minerals that may be in it that um, we would normally pay for uh, is it actually this waste product and if we transform it then we can use it um, and recycle it that way. If done properly the biosolids can actually improve soil texture as well and again this is the same types of uh, reasons we might want to compost our you know kitchen scrap wastes. Um, improving, using, reusing the waste in order to improve um, soil without, um, without straight up paying for the fertilizer and, you know, soil aeration, whatever else you need to do. Okay, it's also nice that it's just simply uh, a good disposal source. Uh, we can also potentially harvest energy during the production of these biosolids. Um, as we're letting a pile of sludge decompose and process, one of the things that's going to happen is we can end up having methane formation. So CH4 um, can be a byproduct depending on how we're processing this in some sort of system. If we can harvest CH4, that's methane, from our setup, then we're directly um, producing some energy from that biogas. And so all things told, this is ultimately a, a potential way to recover costs of dealing with our, our waste that would normally just simply be uh, landfilled or um, you know, we're, we're paying to uh, get rid of it in some one way or the other. <coughs> okay, so here's a picture um, that kind of shows a pile of biosolids accumulating in some container. Um, and I just wanted to give you the formal definition here and a, another a few factors that uh, really control the, the way in which we produce biosolids and how they're processed. Okay, so to quote one of our textbooks, biosolids com composting is the aerobic thermophilic decomposition of organic constituents to a relatively stable humus-like material. So humus-like, that means soil-like. Um, we, we say um, we have the, the soil scale, you've probably seen it before, and we've got sand, loam, um, sandy loam type stuff, and humus. Um, it, it's really that organic component, um, 
so non-mineral component of soils, we, we call that humus. Um, so we're essentially transforming our organic stuff, organic constituents, into soil-like material. <clears throat> really just a another way of saying composting, right? Um, now it says aerobic, that means we're adding oxygen, we're making sure it has oxygen uh, accessible. Thermophilic, meaning that it's going to end up producing heat and that's going to be a good thing for the process. And that combination of biological activity uh, with elevated temperature is going to be largely what's transforming, um, transforming this stuff. So a few important factors here would be the moisture content. Uh, can't have too little, otherwise we really don't have biological activity and too much and it's just gonna stay kind of muddy sludge. So the pH of the, the soil mixture stuff, and the temperature, as I mentioned, and the amount of oxygen available, uh, the type of microbes we're using, we can actually use fungi to do it. Bacteria are pretty much always gonna be there uh, and some other organisms that um, can be used. The material type and that nutrient ratio, the CNP ratio. Those are all important uh, in order to, to really, uh, these are driving factors of what the, what the process is gonna look like, how quickly it's gonna happen, um, and are we gonna have the right uh, processes occurring. So here's a, another picture of biosolids applied to uh, a bit of a crop area. So we have these ridges and this material looks looks like it's a some sort of biosolids mixed perhaps with um, this other material, maybe a, a mulch of some sort. And so it's going to provide a, a nutritious aerated um, base for the plants to grow in. Okay, um, on that note, here's a bunch of benefits from the soil. Uh, again, getting this from one of the uh, extra textbooks we have. Um, if anybody's specifically interested, I'll, I'll uh, be happy to give you the, um, the chapter that I took the, these resources from. But overall, it's, it's a good thing for the soil is the point here. We have, um, you know, we're recycling this, the nutrients, we're reducing the dependence on chemical fertilizers, which cost a fair bit to manufacture. Um, Sometimes it, it may reduce the, the need for pesticides, um, can provide some micronutrients that we don't typically capture with our standard fertilizers. It often hold, increases the amount of water that the soil can hold while also increasing the aeration um, or, and drainage for clay-like soils. So if you have sandy, sandy uh, soil, then maybe you need to improve the water holding capacity and that could do that or if you've got clay, then you're probably looking for the kind of the opposite, more aeration, more drainage, permeability. Um, ultimately, it's, it's going to provide kind of that topsoil type of environment. And if you mix it with your soil there, it can, can really help. OK, some disadvantages. Um, odor, specifically at the production site, is an obvious one. <coughs> If you imagine a pile of sludge composting, that just does not sound very pleasant, and nor does it smell very pleasant. Um, you may have experienced this if you've done composting on uh, of your own at any point. It generally doesn't smell great, and it really starts to stink if you're not if it's not properly aerated. What we don't want here is anaerobic processes. Well, normally we don't want it if we're trying to produce some methane from it and doing a multiple step process, then maybe we do, but um, I'll show you a video on that towards the end of the lecture. Okay, so we've got this anaerobic process. Um, we don't want that because that's gonna make bad smells. So it's important to keep enough oxygen in the pile of composting materials. So that means you need to mix it every so often. And even still, you're probably going to have some smells. So another disadvantage is the potential 
um, for pathogens to survive the process and end up in the end product. Um, we also know that sometimes when we're dispersing biosolids, we end up um, sending out what we would call secondary pathogens. Uh, so this is a, a pretty big concern for people that work as uh, the land appliers. They're applying the biosolids to land. Um, there are allergens, um, so different fungal spores, things like that, that uh, are not directly pathogens, but may cause allergies, things like that would be uh, kind of secondary pathogens. And then there's another potential disadvantage if your sludge quality changes over time, which certainly could, especially if you have wastewater that's not entirely consistent and maybe you have fluctuations in temperature due to season changes. Um, you can certainly have a situation where the product quality of this fertilizer material is not the same you know, every, every single day. And so anybody wanting to use it um, has to kind of face that challenge. <clears throat> okay, so how do we regulate the biosolids? Well, really we hold them to a couple different standards. We have class A and class B. So class A biosolids, these are the most stringent. Um, we are able to use these in locations where public might the public might contact the land um, because they've been held to um, standards that pretty much guarantee enough reduction of pathogens that uh, we no longer are worried about um, you know, a big risk of pathogens from contacting the, uh, the stuff. Class B is not as high quality. They've not been held at a high, as high of a temperature uh, or for as long of a time. And these are for agriculture. Um, and again, these, these would be the ones that are not appropriate for um, agriculture that is intended for human use. And these are also restricted to lands where no public contact um, occurs. So on private lands where there's no, uh, no public access. So there's a couple ways we um, regulate in terms of uh, the parameters we have to achieve to result in class A or class B biosolids. Class A, these must be processed in what we call aerated static pile or in-vessel systems. They have to be at 55 degrees Celsius for at least three days. So here we have the time and the temperature. This is a lot like pasteurization. So pasteurization, we do this to milk and some other products to not quite sterilize, but to reduce pathogens to a, a level where there's really no, no inherent risk anymore. Um, maybe there's a few surviving cells, but not, not enough to uh, make a difference. If you keep, if you keep uh, really anything at that temperature, so 55 degrees Celsius, that's gonna be what? Um, 37 degrees is body temperature, so that's quite a bit above that. This is probably 120 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. Um, so that's gonna kill a lot of bacteria um, and specifically nearly all enteric bacteria. It's also going to help um, most viruses degrade. <clears throat> the coronavirus, for example, cannot last more than about a, a day or two in tap water that's been uh, dechlorinated at room temperature. And if you increase that temperature, it um, dies even quicker. So that's just a, you know, viruses are not super stable outside of a biological environment. Class B, on the other hand, we still have this 55 degrees Celsius metric, um, but this can be done in what's called a windrow system. So it's that difference in the type of system is what makes a big difference. It's not gonna have as much aeration um, or as much mixing. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, essentially, it requires uh, 
that for at least 15 days with five turns or 40 degrees Celsius or higher for five days during which the temperature exceeded 55 degrees Celsius at some point or for at least um, four hours during that, that time frame. Okay, so there's a few, a few different options um, or a few different uh, considerations for the different, um, different classes. Essentially, the, the process itself makes it so that the class A experience that high temperature with oxygen for a longer time in a you know kind of a guaranteed manner. <coughs> One of the other considerations here is how much heavy metals are we adding? So in addition to the NPDES regulations we talked about kind of at the beginning of our wastewater uh, discussions, that's the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. That's for discharge into surface waters. This system also ends up regulating biosolids uh, because when we apply the biosolids to land, um, in a way it's like we're discharging instead of to a river, it's just straight to the land, and then water will run off, you know, when it rains, that runoff will contain some of those contaminants. So we end up regulating the land application through the NPDES system. So one of the things about land application is that you're potentially adding lead and arsenic cadmium, all these toxic um, heavy metals to land, and we don't ever want to have um, a situation where the this land and the soil there becomes um, polluted at toxic amounts. So there's uh, the regulations, the way they work is there's a lifetime maximum amount of biosolids that can be added to a given plot of land based on some calculations regarding how much heavy metals are in the waste. So we have some sort of ceiling and a direct pollution concentration in the actual sludge where we have limitations. And then, you know, maybe some field, um, one particular field, you can land apply this high quality biosolids for, you know, eight years, a couple times a year, and then you're at your limit and you can no longer use the biosolids. Um, so that's that's our way of uh, making sure that uh, we don't, you know, have huge huge amounts of lead, for example, and that's in milligrams per kilogram of soil. So milligrams of the contaminant per kilogram of the soil. So that's a mass concentration there. Okay, so taking a look at the the different steps, um, the first thing we would want to do is dewater the sludge. So sludge is almost always going to be high liquid content and then add some bulking agent if needed. Uh, these bulking agents will you know, it'll be something like sawdust or rice hulls, coconut husk, something like that that's cheap, it's organic, um, and it allows the sludge to compost with enough um, contact with the air. So really it's um, when we say bulking, that's adding that volume in a way that's going to allow um, for it to have a better contact, a better porosity, uh, allowing air to be uh, exchanging in and out and any residual water to, um, to drain out as well. So if you're ever operating your own compost and it gets too sludgy, you might consider adding some sawdust to it. Okay, so then the goal, the next goal is to achieve that temperature. And usually what we want is between 55 and 65 Celsius. It's gonna con achieve pathogen control and dewater it a little bit further with evaporation. We don't want the temperature to get too hot. So it is possible and a big problem when landfills catch on fire. Um, it's also possible to have fires when you're composting sludge like this, the biological activity and the chemical reactions that are happening can actually, if not controlled properly, can get to a point where they're, they've, you have a runaway reaction and the heat, um, it, it ends up getting too hot and you can have uh, kind of a, a low grade combustion there. 
it's pretty dangerous um, and quite polluting, especially in the, the case of landfills. So that's, there's actually lots of controls um, in place to detect and try to prevent and mitigate uh, landfill fires in, in sludge composting operations, biosolids comp uh, operations. One of the reasons you mix it is to make sure that you're not getting too much, um, too much of this heating activity happening. So you don't have to heat this yourself. The, the biological and resulting chemistry, chemical activities, um, that's going to provide enough heat. And so then the, you, know, you just need to control um, with mixing and all of that how much you're actually allowing, you know, what temperature you're actually allowing it to get to. Okay, so after the, the primary step of that composting, you do want some time to let it stabilize, cool back down. Um, you know, if you've got some residual liquids, maybe let that dry out. Um, that's uh, another important step. Um, and again, drying if needed. Um, and sometimes you might separate at this point your bulking agent if, uh, if possible. I don't think that's very common though. I think normally you just use something that it doesn't matter if it uh, stays in for long periods of time. Okay, so for moisture content, what we typically are looking for is at least 12 to 15%. Um, that's kind of required for any biological activity to be happening. Um, if we have less than 40% moisture content, uh, then we may have a situation where the biological activity is inhibited. So really we, we're gonna want more than 40. Optimum is 50 to 60. And then if you get too much above 60, it's gonna be too muddy. That's when you would want to dewater um, and maybe bulk it some more. We could take a look at um, how much uh, how much uh, mixing in wood chips. Here's a graph showing us kind of the effect of solids content on the ratio of wood chips to biosolids by volume. So, you know, maybe you, you want to uh, know how much wood chips you need to add um, kind of as a ratio. You know, one to one would be here. So if your sludge solids percent is high, then you um, you know, at 30 something percent, then you could use this little plot and say, oh, okay, so here, you know, if my sludge solids um, content is here, then I only need a one-to-one -one ratio of sludge to um, bulking agent. Whereas if your sludge composition is not much solids, it's mostly moisture and um, liquids and stuff, then maybe you need lots of bulking agent per volume of sludge. Um, so it kind of highlights the importance of dewatering. If you dewater it very well, then you maybe don't need any bulking agent at all. Okay, so here, here are what we call the aerated static pile processes. So this is a fancy term for a pile of dirt. Um, but it's, it's actually, it is fancier than a pile of dirt. So what we have here is um, these mounds, and these mounds are our composting sludge. We've added the bulking agent, we've dewatered them. Um, so really this is sludge and bulking agent in here. And what we're doing here is we're actually um, covering these with a kind of a, a uh, a protective blanket sometimes, a, a screen, and we're, we're allowing this entire area to lay on top of some aeration system. So what we're going to do here with this aeration system is essentially we're going to be, um, we have this perforated pipe underneath it, and we are pulling air and whatever water comes out through that system. So air is coming in as we see, it's coming in and then it's being withdrawn through this pipe. Whatever liquids that have been escaping will be collected here. So liquids will go out. And then air um, is being exhausted perhaps through another small pile of compost, which can kind of filter it over here. Um, probably have some sort of screen on that. 
So this whole system is really just pulling air through the compost pile. Um, this is called static because we're not mixing this one uh, and we can get away with that, or at least not mixing it often. We can get away with that if we have um, this air and it's controlled well enough so that it's coming through the whole pile. And you might have several stacks of these um, composting away and after a certain amount of time then you can take this pile and um, take it and then let it stabilize and then go use it somewhere else. So you might be operating multiple piles, maybe one week's worth of solids gets added to one pile and it's cycling out um, as it processes. There's a few in-vessel composting system designs we see here and most of these are going to have some sort of air feed, some way of mixing, and some way of adding the, um, the sludge. So in the panel A here we have sludge coming in, it's kind of distributed throughout this pile. Um, this is being mixed uh, probably relatively slowly, uh, but has some mixing nonetheless. Then air is being pushed uh, with kind of with a pump action through here and that's kind of the the system and slowly we can harvest uh, the process sludge through here so it's a little bit like a, a plug flow reactor a very long hydraulic residence time um, or, or a slow moving CSTR I guess um, giving that sludge enough time in here to have proper composting given this aeration. And really most of these are going to have some design that's like that. You know, maybe you add a different system here, grout graded stone here to um, be an air injection port. Um, and you're extracting the material over here. There's different ways to do it, but as effectively you've got a system um, where you have that composting going on in the vessel. Uh, maybe you have over here uh, compost coming in um, and it's being mixed by these little auger drill things, um, providing that mixing and uh, some aeration as well, coming in through here and just uh, kind of pushing, pushing up through the sludge. So all sorts of different ways. Um, plenty of technologies out there uh, to do this processing. Okay, so we have a little bit of time. I want to show you a few uh, videos. I'm going to make sure that you're going to be able to hear this through my audio. So just give me a moment. You can take a a closer look at your leisure. I'm just going to introduce you to the videos, maybe watch a little bit of them, uh, skip through some of them with you, uh, but I find them all kind of interesting. So the first one, we're going to look at this biogas production. I mentioned um, using biogas and essentially what we can consider is the fact that um, if we do part of the composting in anaerobic situation, then we form the methane and we can harvest that methane um, and get that energy recovery at the same time we're doing the um, doing the nutrient removal. So let me get this over here. Okay, you should be able to hear that. I think. Okay, and this is going to be somewhat of a funny advertisement. Welcome to a virtual tour through one of Bioconstruct's biogas plants. biogas plant uses ensilaged maize as one of its renewable raw materials. With the aid of a wheel loader, the maize is tipped into a cement storage bin, which needs filling up approximately once a day. Silo maize is rich in energy, and on account of its high degree of reduction, very well suited for use in biogas plants. 
This storage bin is equipped with a hydraulic floor discharger that continuously feeds the maize onto a conveyor belt. A scale under the conveyor belt registers the weight of the maize silage. Liquid manure is the most important basic substrate used in this biogas plant. After a short interim storage in the pig styes, it is pumped through pipes directly into the blending pump beside the maize conveyor belt. At the same time, the maize falls off the conveyor belt into this apparatus, which is equipped with two mixing rollers. So what we see there is they're mixing the pig manure, so direct um, waste, and the corn stuff, um, the waste corn husks and, and all that, uh, kind of pro providing a bulking agent. Now, this, this is called an anaerobic digester, and they're doing a little bit more than biosolids in this portion. They're, they're doing the wastewater treatment and biosolids formation at the same time. Um, what we've been talking about is after you have already done the aerobic process and you've got um, your waste activated sludge, you've kind of treated a lot of the waste already. In this case, they're taking raw manure um, and sending it through this process. So it's a little bit different, but um, you, can, you can sort of do the same for both. I'll let you continue listening here. To minimize smells and to help prevent epidemics. Now the liquid waste is heated with hot water to 70 degrees centigrade in a tubular heat exchanger using a countercurrent process. After heating for one hour, the hygienization of the substrates is complete so that they can now also be poured into the fermenters. Here is where the biogas is formed. The substrates are continuously stirred in order to prevent layers of material forming at the top or on the bottom. A hot water wall heater heats the substrate to between 35 and 55 degrees centigrade in order to accelerate the formation of methane. On average, the substrate is in the fermenter for a period of around 30 days before it is filled into another fermenter for a further 30 days to complete the gas formation process. When fermentation is complete, the thin liquid substrate is pumped into two reinforced concrete tanks where it is stored until it can be brought out onto the fields. Fermenters are filled regularly with biomass, are airtight, heated and regularly stirred. The biogas forms within a matter of days. The formation of gas is a complex and delicate process. The organic fats or carbohydrates contained in the substrates are digested by various kinds of bacteria. And this is the starting point for the development of the gas. If the contents are continually stirred, the gas rises slowly to the top of the container. It consists of approximately 50 to 70 percent methane, coloured green here, and also carbon dioxide, water vapour, hydrogen and hydrogen sulphide. As water vapour and hydrogen sulphide are problematic for the utilisation of the gas later, it is necessary to treat the biogas now. The gas is first freed from water vapour, coloured blue here. The condensation water is collected in a condensation shaft and pumped out. The aggressive trace gas hydrogen sulphide is now extracted from the biogas in a biological desulphurization plant. By introducing air into the container, certain bacteria cultures are able to establish colonies on the chain. Here they decompose hydrogen sulphide into harmless sulphur and water. The almost unpressurized biogas is then fed into a compressor where it is brought up to the 70 millibar pressure later required for burning. In order to completely condense any remaining water vapor and free the biogas from any suspended matter or silicates, the biogas is subjected to a washing and drying process. This is carried out with a vapor at almost freezing point so that the gas is cooled down to a temperature of under 5 degrees centigrade. Okay, so the, the video kind of continues with some of the processes, but I wanted to show you that biogas formation. It's not exactly the, um, the biosolids production, but what they would end up with would be biosolids and then that biogas. 
um, because they're doing doing all those steps. Um, it's also just a, a different way of treating some uh, specific type of waste, so I thought that um, that would be interesting. So the next would be this quick um, little demonstration of uh, phosphorus uh, limitations, and again, this is um, a little bit of an advertisement for somebody who sells these floating mixer things and describes a little bit of the process of why the phosphorus removal works. It'll be a little bit of a repetition of some of the things we mentioned today, um, but I find it pretty informative. So, Welcome to Medora Corporation's educational whiteboard series, Everything Wastewater, produced for engineers, system owners, management, and personnel to answer commonly asked questions about wastewater applications and Medora Corporation equipment. How can Medora's floating wastewater mixing equipment be used to meet phosphorus limits in a wastewater lagoon? In the next three minutes or so, we'll explain the basic process and equipment needed to achieve the best, most economical, and easiest phosphorus removal in the industry. Where to start? Let's dig into some quick phosphorus fundamentals. Phosphorus is an abundant, naturally occurring element essential to all life on Earth. Excessive phosphorus in waterways and water bodies can cause environmental complications such as dense plant, algae, and cyanobacteria growth known as eutrophication. By removing phosphorus during the wastewater treatment process, there are less potential downstream negative impacts. Less phosphorus release, less negative environmental impact. And as time moves on, Phosphorus discharge limits for lagoons will only become more strict, increasing the urgency for a reliable and effective phosphorus removal strategy. So let's get our removal on. Phosphorus can be removed from a lagoon by applying a precipitating agent like aluminum sulfate or ferric chloride. Once precipitated, the phosphorus harmlessly falls out of the water column and into the sludge sediments. Precipitant dispersal is a very hands-on and costly process requiring extensive labor, time, infrastructure, and accessory resources. In short, it can be spendy, spendy, spendy. This is where Medora's floating wastewater mixing equipment can make phosphorus removal a whole lot easier and more cost effective. And it all starts with a floating wastewater mixer. The mixer is anchored using a single shore to shore tether cable which is able to span most lagoon dimensions. Once tethered, an injection hose is run from shore to the machine fastened along the tether cable terminating just below the machine impeller. And just like that, Medora's floating wastewater mixer is now ready to receive and distribute the phosphorus precipitant of your choice. Consult with your chemical supplier for proper sizing of metering pumps, chemical storage, and dosing rates for your lagoon. Then. All is left is the final connection to the mixer injection hose, and you're ready to rock. The phosphorus precipitating agent is sent from the onshore metering system down the injection hose to the machine just below the impeller. Here, the precipitating agent is fully mixed into the entire direct flow of the floating wastewater mixer. And this is where great mixing takes center stage. The well-mixed precipitant is then distributed radially across the lagoon utilizing proven long-distance circulation technology. It creates an ideal interaction environment between your precipitating agent and the target phosphorus. In many cases, when compared to traditional application methods, only half as much precipitant is needed to achieve better phosphorus removal, or simply put, the better the mixing, the better the phosphorus precipitation. And Medora wastewater mixing is the best there is. Even better yet, Medora Corporation has effective mixing options no matter your lagoon size. 1 acre, 15 acres, more, less, in between, doesn't matter. Medora Corporation has you covered. Medora Floating Wastewater. Okay. So, just a simple little advertisement for their environmental technology, and it kind of highlights the importance of mixing um, for specifically for phosphorus removal, but kind of the same principle applies to lots of different, um, different systems. Okay, the last one, um, and again, this has got... Uh, funny or maybe you might call cute little animations of bacteria um, so this one's covering nitrogen removal in water and this is really um, we already kind of talked about this a little bit so it goes in a little more depth I'll just skim it for you real quick in case you're you know inspired to watch it on your own you'll have the slides um, I do apologize I forgot to post the uh, blank slides for you uh, but I'll do that in a moment um, so I'll just skip through this a little bit and then um, we'll wrap up from there. Nitrogen are food processing waste, chemical cleaning agents, and many other industrial components. Nitrogen is present in wastewater in various forms which have been lumped into separate general categories. 
Nitrogen in the form of ammonia is ammonia nitrogen. There is also nitrite nitrogen and nitrate nitrogen, which are usually formed during the actual biological processes at the wastewater treatment plant. In addition to these forms, nitrogen makes up a small percentage of the cell mass of the organisms in the system, as well as other dissolved organic compounds. This category is referred to as organic nitrogen, of which a certain amount typically cannot be removed through the biological processes that will be described in this video. Total nitrogen, as the name implies, is the sum of all types of nitrogen. TKN, or total Kaldal nitrogen, named after the scientist Johann Kaldal, is the sum of only organic nitrogen and ammonia nitrogen. TIN, or total inorganic nitrogen, is just as the name implies, the total nitrogen minus the organic nitrogen. In simplistic terms, nitrogen in various forms is flushed, rinsed, or otherwise introduced into the sewer system. Almost all of this organic nitrogen, urea for example, is immediately hydrolyzed into ammonia. In water, gaseous ammonia, NH3, is almost entirely forms, ionic and gaseous. It is not necessarily in water with a pH between so 6.8 and 7.5. Kind of how, how the bacteria that do these transformations that we talked about, denitrification, nitrification, um, all of those processes, kind of how they work what their pH ranges are, um, where they can happily do it. So it kind of goes into more depth about, about all those processes, even in terms of in a particle, um, maybe how this inside one little particle they're showing here, the denitrification can happen on the outer layer, but then there's the anoxic area in the middle. So you can get a little bit of both processes um, and goes through a couple of um, kind of engineering design uh, scenarios and discusses the, the solutions. So definitely informative. I uh, encourage you to take a look. That one's the Vimeo uh, video. Um, but with that, that's all I have for you today. Um, on Thursday, we'll be going through uh, the homework solutions and any other questions you have. Um, I'll stay here for a, a couple moments longer in case you had any questions about nutrient removal, biosolids, or, or anything we talked about today. And I'll be posting these slides uh, to Moodle in a few minutes. So otherwise, um, unless there are any questions, then that would be, that would be it for today. And I hope you uh, have a good, have a good week and hope you enjoy as best you can the um, remainder of this strange semester online. All right, um, by the way, I'm posting a recording of this. Uh, you know, I normally get it from uh, Twitch, but this time I'm just gonna post it directly. I, I have this recording just in case there's there were any issues with the stream, it doesn't look like there was, but um, I will be posting a, a direct recording shortly for you as well. Okay, well, I will see you guys on Thursday.